Network Show. This is the Sunday edition, January 17th, 2021. It's Dr. King uh, weekend. And, uh, you know, um, I've been airing some, re-airing some uh, broadcasts I've done uh, dealing with Dr. King on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. So uh, we talked a little bit about that on uh, Friday's show, uh, a little bit about Dr. King on Friday's show, and then also I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered on uh, Friday also. So on our, uh, let's see, on the show tomorrow, we'll share some excerpts of um, you know, Roland Martin Unfiltered and what we discussed. But today we want to deal with um, deal with uh, some of Dr. King's legacy and dispelling myths about Dr. King. Because there's so many myths and misinformation uh, about Dr. King. And you, you hear a lot of it this time of the year. And, you know, a lot of people mean well and things like that. Uh, but, um, you know, um, I've said before, I don't go to a lot of Dr. King Day celebrations. And it's not because I don't like Dr. King. I do, but it's because uh, a lot of Dr. King Day celebrations, uh, it seems that they're organized by people who never studied Dr. King. So, <laughs> and I, I, I speak here and there at Dr. King Day celebrations. I don't get asked to speak at a lot of them because I deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't deal with the Dr. King that they can use to pimp white corporations for guilt money. I don't deal with the, I don't deal with the Dr. King that is used to make uh, white people feel comfortable with the oppression of African Americans. Okay. That's the, uh, that's the distorted uh, legacy of Dr. King. All right. So we deal with the we deal with the real history and deal with the revolutionary uh, Dr. King. OK, so we're going to talk about uh, some of that on today's show. I have uh, some uh, clips, some articles uh, to share. And then also today is the uh, birth date of another one of my heroes, the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali. We know Dr. King's birthday is January 15th, okay, born in 1929. And then also today is the birth date of the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, born Cassius Marsalis Clay, okay, born in 1942. So you see me with one of my Muhammad Ali shirts on, right? And then you see Muhammad Ali behind me as well. Always have the two pictures of Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X behind me. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this. So we'll do a Dr. King's distorted legacy. We'll deal with some myths about Dr. King, dispelling some myths about Dr. King. This is a good article from the Washington Post dealing with five myths about Dr. King, uh, five myths about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This was written by uh, Donna Murch. And we talked about that some before in this show. And we'll talk a little bit about Malcolm X as well because they're all connected, all right? And uh, I'm going to share an excerpt of a, um, interview that Dr. King did in 1967, okay, 1967 with NBC News. This is from, uh, this is from uh, March, uh, I think it's March 1967, I think, no, it has to be, uh, be May 1967, uh, May 8th, 1967. And it's called After Civil Rights, Black Power. After Civil Rights, Black Power. Okay. So it's uh, a lot of people haven't heard this uh, interview or seen the interview. And it causes, it will cause people to, I think, look at Dr. King differently and see from after the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, there was a shift in Dr. King from civil rights to human rights. So you really have to study the trajectory and chronology of Dr. King's life. And then also we need to read books that Dr. King wrote as well, because um, Dr. King wrote five books. OK, Dr. King wrote five books and 
you know, unfortunately, um, a lot of times people don't know that. And I'm, I listen to what they say, and I'm like, uh, "You talking about? Are you talking about Doctor King? Or are you talking about BB King uh, or Evelyn Champagne King? Which, I mean, which King are you talking about?" Okay, so uh, this is this is Doctor King's last book, and probably to me his most important book. Where do we go from here, chaos or community? Where do we go from here, chaos or community? All right. Uh, so you'll probably hear this reference. Hopefully you hear this referenced uh, a lot, you know, in the next few days, hopefully. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> all right. Now on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, he heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts, you can control the comforts of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, to sign up for our email newsletter as well. Okay. Uh, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN Show, through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN Show through Cash App, and then also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. So the donations really help out because we're here six days a week instead of one day a week for four years. We were doing Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, right here on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF in Detroit. As of October 12th, 2020, we started doing Mondays Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight and Sunday. So I'm on the air six days a week. So there's a lot of research, uh, a lot of time commitment. So uh, that definitely helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcast and pay some of the bills by all this paper and ink that I keep going through as well. So we definitely appreciate that. So dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. And then also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show and at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And all my DVD lectures and digital downloads are at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, including a um, presentation I've done uh, dealing with the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The revolutionary will not be televised on the television. OK, the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The revolutionary will not be televised on the television. We have that in uh, DVD and digital download format. So we'll post a link to that also. Okay, so um, before the break here, uh, we're coming up here on a break in a few minutes. Um, I want to uh, go to a little bit of, we'll jump into a little bit of this, uh, I think, interview from uh, let, let's do this. We're going, we're going to go to the clip with uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, Jalen. We'll do that first because that's only uh, less than two minutes. And since we're coming up on a break, I don't want to break up the interview with uh, uh, NBC. So on March 30th, 1967, Muhammad Ali and Dr. King had a meeting. Muhammad Ali and Dr. King had a secret friendship. OK, a lot of people don't know about this. There was a uh, article from biography dot com um, that talked about the secret friendship between Muhammad Ali and Dr. King and uh, an unexpected uh, friendship because Dr. King was a Baptist minister. Muhammad Ali was a um, uh, a minister in the nation of Islam. And you would think, you know, what was what, what's, what's Dr. King? doing with this black Muslim, you know, what's Dr. King doing with him? All right. But they had a secret friendship. So there was a meeting that they had March 30th, 1967. And this is, um, this is 
the month before uh, Muhammad Ali refuses to be uh, drafted into the army, which is going to be April 1967. And then this is also a few days before Dr. King officially comes out against the Vietnam War, which was April 4th, 1967. OK, let's go to this clip, Jay. What did you discuss back in the hotel room? Nothing. Just friends, just like crew chef and, and uh, Kennedy and <laughs> everybody. When the people, all of the politicians of all other white races come together, and they, although they believe different, they think different, whites can come together and discuss the common cause. But whenever a few of us come together, the world is shook up. And I say, whatever went back there is our business. Reverend King, do you agree? Oh, yes, yes. We had a very good discussion. Uh, on uh, many matters, and of course these are not things that we would discuss here, but uh, we do have common problems and common concerns, and above all, as uh, Muhammad Ali has just said, uh, we are all victims of the same system of oppression, and even though we may have different religious uh, beliefs, uh, this does not at all and bring about a difference in Still terms brother. of our concern. Still brother. Do you share the same, just one more question, do you share the same concern uh, that uh, Muhammad has for his draft status? Oh, I certainly do. Uh, my, my views on the draft are clear. I'm against it. And I think the sooner our country does away with the draft, the better it will be for everybody. I'm dis very disturbed about the militaristic posture of our nation. And I think until we have a radical reordering of priorities in our country, uh, we are going more and more to the depths and, I should say, to the doom that follows arrogance of power, Senator Fulbright said. Okay, yeah, pause it right there. And I'm going to play that again. We're coming up on the break. I'm going to play that again. But, but Muhammad Ali said he talked about the differences between he and Dr. King. But he said, we're still brothers. At the end of the day, we're still brothers. And that's such a powerful statement. This is, this is Muhammad Ali before he refuses to be drafted, okay, in, into the army. And he's going to be stripped of his title. The, the, the U.S. government did to Ali what no man in the ring could do to him, take away his title. And then when Dr. King comes out in opposition to the Vietnam War, April 4th, 1967, overnight, overnight, he becomes the most hated man in America. All right, we're going to deal with this on the other side of the break. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is a call in number. If you have a question or comment, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio, on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. For 25 years, Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. The Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History One on One Mobile Museum and is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop, and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among change makers for NBC Universal's Race the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History 101 Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197. Or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com. bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. 
Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at cometicwear.com. Visit 4glossygirls.com, that's the number 4glossygirls.com, and follow them on Instagram at 4glossygirls. Black Bees products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our Nile Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bee created a high quality, natural, organic purse care line that would be affordable to everyone. Hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 on the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is uh, Sunday, January 17th, 2021, and we are live. It's Dr. King Day uh, weekend, and uh, we're dealing with Dr. King's distorted legacy. We're going to deal with some myths about Dr. King as well. Uh, so right before the break, I shared an excerpt of this interview that Dr. King Muhammad Ali did uh, March 30th, 1967, March 30th, 1967. Uh, and this was um, one month, this was the month before Muhammad Ali came out against the Vietnam War. And this was also, um, the, a few days before, uh, this, this was the month before, yeah, uh, a few days before Dr. King came out against the Vietnam War, and this was the uh, month before Muhammad Ali refused to be drafted into the army as well and go fight in Vietnam. Um, I'm going to go back to this. We're going to play this one more time. Some people haven't heard this before. It's a short clip, so we're going to play this again, and then. Um, we're going to get into this. Um, I, I want to get to the uh, interview that Dr. King did um, May 8th, uh, 1967 also. But let's go back to this uh, uh, short interview. Muhammad Ali, the greatest of all time, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What did you discuss back in the hotel room? Nothing. Just friends, just like crew chef and, and uh, Kennedy and <laughs> everybody. When the people, all of the politicians of all other white races come together, and they, although they believe different, they think different, whites can come together and discuss the common cause. But whenever a few of us come together, the world is shook up. And I say, whatever went back there is our business. Reverend King, do you agree? Oh, yes, yes. We had a very good discussion. Uh, on uh, many matters, and of course these are not things that we would discuss here, but uh, we do have common problems and common concerns, and above all, as uh, Muhammad Ali has just said, uh, we are all victims of the same system of oppression, and even though we may have different religious uh, beliefs, uh, this does not at all 
is bring about a difference in terms brother. of our concerns. Uh, you Thank share you. the same, one more question, do you share the same concern uh, that uh, Muhammad has for his draft status? Oh, I certainly do. Uh, my, my views on the draft are clear. I'm against it. And I think the sooner our country does away with the draft, the better it will be for everybody. I'm dis very disturbed about the militaristic posture of our nation. And I think until we have a radical reordering of priorities in our country, uh, we're going more and more to the depths and, I should say, to the doom that follows arrogance of power, as Senator Fulbright says. Okay, so uh, Dr. King said that even though we have different religions, we still basically have the same concerns for our people. And Muhammad Ali said we're still brothers. Okay, see, that's, that's, that is crucial because a lot of times we allow religion or ideology or pseudo ideology or what have you to divide us as a people and we still have the same problems we still have the same we're still fighting against the same conditions now malcolm x was calling for a unification of the civil rights leaders while he was still in the nation of islam there was uh the the there's an article from the washington post that deals with the day dr king met malcolm x okay uh, the day Dr. King met Malcolm X. And it talks about, well, first of all, when that, that was March 26, 1964. And when Dr. King meets Malcolm X, Malcolm, meets, Malcolm X meets Dr. King. This is at the Senate uh, debate, U.S. Senate debate for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Okay, there's a debate going on, there's a filibuster taking place. Uh, there's an article from Deneen L. Brown, Deneen L. Brown for Washington Post. Martin Luther King Jr. met Malcolm X just once. The photo still haunts us with what was lost. The photo still ha haunts us with what was lost. And see, a lot of people don't know Malcolm joins the civil rights movement when he officially separates from the nation of Islam. When When, when we talk about Dr. King, we have to study the chronology of Dr. King's life and what period of time you're talking about. When we talk about Malcolm, it's crucial to study the chronology, the trajectory of Malcolm's life, what period of time that you're talking about. Because a lot of people want to quote Malcolm out of context. And it's like, is this Malcolm while he's with the Nation of Islam? Is this Malcolm when he left the Nation of Islam? Is this Malcolm before he left to go to Mecca, late April 64? Is this Malcolm before he went to Mecca? So Malcolm officially separates from the nation of Islam March 8, 1964. He meets Dr. King for the first and only, only time late March 64, but it's before he goes to Mecca. That was March 26, 1964. So when people talk about Malcolm's speech, the battle or the bullet, that he gave at least three times that I know of, first time March 29, 1964 in Washington Heights, New York, Second time, April 3rd, 1964 in Cleveland, Ohio. Third time, April 4th, 1964 in Detroit, Michigan at the at the historic King Solomon Baptist Church. When he gives that speech, it's a few days after he meets Dr. King. He references the Senate debate on the Civil Rights Act of 1964 because he was just there witnessing it on March 26, 1964. Okay, so, and then you got to study Malcolm's speeches after the battle of the bullet because some people are like that's the only speech malcolm ever gave just like some people are like i have a dream which was originally called normalcy normalcy never again i have a dream is not even the original name of the speech yeah, a lot of people are like that's the only speech dr king ever gave and then the speech was changed the name of the speech was changed to a cancel check okay so um but that's a powerful interview with dr king and malcolm I mean, Dr. King, Muhammad Ali, but April, uh, uh, July 31st, 1963, when Malcolm is still in the nation of Islam, Malcolm sends a letter to the leading civil rights leaders, including Dr. King, and he's calling for, a, he, he's requesting a meeting with the civil rights leaders, and he's calling for a unification of the civil rights leaders and their followers, 
Okay, and when and, and when uh, uh, Malcolm meets Dr. King, he tells Dr. King, "I'm throwing myself into the heart of the civil rights struggle. I'm throwing myself into the heart of the civil rights struggle." And uh, Malcolm is calling for a unification of the civil rights leaders and their followers. And he says, "If John F. Kennedy can meet with Nikita Khrushchev, who was the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, he said if they can set aside their major differences and meet." then Negro leaders should be able to set aside our minor differences and, and meet. And he said, we have to find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. This is Malcolm while he's still in the nation of Islam. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, Dr. King, did, so, and, and Malcolm said, if you could not send a, uh, if you cannot attend, could you uh, send a representative? Um, so Dr. King, um, did not attend and did not send a representative uh, either to that meeting. Uh, and that and that was the month before the March on Washington, which was August 28, 1963. OK, now. Uh, the, the interview with Dr. King and Malcolm X. At this time, March 30th, 1967, see, Malcolm is already assassinated February 21st, 1965. These two. Dr. King and Muhammad Ali, I should say, Dr. King and Muhammad Ali. These two were probably the most recognizable African-American men, probably, definitely in America, probably in the world. Okay. And you're talking to both of them at the same time. There's an article from uh, biography.com. And I've talked about this before from January 14th. 2020, uh, January 14th, 2019, and it was updated January 21st, 2020. It's called Martin Luther King Jr. and Muhammad Ali's Surprising Secret Friendship. Martin Luther King Jr. and Muhammad Ali's Surprising Secret Friendship. Okay, and their birthdays are um, close to each other as well. Dr. King's was uh, Jan January 15th. Muhammad Ali is January 17th. But very quickly here, it, it talks about how in um, 1961, an athlete named Cassius Clay prepared for a bout with Duke uh, Sabadon in Las Vegas. The 10-round boxing match was the young boxer's seventh, but his swagger and charm had already gained him admirers. That day, the man uh, who would soon become Muhammad Ali received a telegram from an unexpected correspondent. Quote, your youthful good humor physical prowess and flippant charm have made you an idol to many American young people. May God protect you and your opponent in the coming contest. It was signed Martin Luther King Jr. Now it was an overture to an unlikely friendship, one that took place on the stormy stage of the civil rights movement, though it is uncertain how many times Dr. King and Muhammad Ali met during their lifetimes, they were friends. They were friends. But publicly, the two men could not have been more opposed, and their secret friendship was only revealed to the public through surveillance files that showed the FBI had long been following both of them. Okay? It was only revealed through uh, 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 surveillance files that showed the FBI had been following them. Now, there's a, there's a new documentary out. And let me know if you've seen it. There's a new documentary out dealing with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the FBI and the surveillance that uh, the, the surveillance the FBI was doing on Dr. King. Um, and I'm going to pull this up here. There was an article from uh, New York Times uh, dealing with this. And there's also one from uh, NPR, National Public Radio. Uh, MLK FBI humanizes a civil rights icon's legacy. Uh, so if you've seen that uh, documentary, give me a call. Let me know uh, what you think about it. And I have to check that out. I still have to watch. I have to watch also One Night in Miami that just became available on Amazon Prime. So that's about a, a fictitious account of a night in uh, 1964 Miami with um, uh, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, and Sam Cooke. They meet at a hotel. We, we've talked about that here before. So it's available uh, right now, Amazon Prime. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. I'm still trying to, 
I haven't had a chance to watch Ma Rainey either on Netflix. I had to watch that as well. Okay, so I'm a little, hey, I'm, I'm doing radio six days a week, doing the best I can. But uh, MLK FBI, uh, New York Times has an article about this, uh, King Hoover and the Tell of the Tape. Sam Pollard's fascinating documentary, documentary chronicles the FBI director's obsession with the private life and political affiliations of the civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Okay, so we'll, we'll post this link here and then uh, we'll probably talk uh, after, uh, after I watch it, we'll talk about it some more. But the call in number is 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to go to this clip here from, uh, we'll go to this clip here from uh, NBC News, the interview with Dr. King from 1967 in just a minute here. Also, if you'd like this type of information, once again, you can donate to the African History Network. Uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App and also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Okay. All right. Um, I, I want to go back to this article here dealing with Dr. Uh, Dr. King and Muhammad Ali. So, despite their differences, Dr. King and Ali had a strong bond. The bond between Dr. King and Muhammad Ali was surprising. Ali was the world's most famous boxer and an outspoken member of the Nation of Islam. Um, they, they focused on uh, uh, separation uh, from, from white people. The Nation of Islam, one of the things, also independence and educating yourself on history, et cetera. Um, they, they, they preached against integration. Uh, now, that was the opposite of Dr. King's ideas of nonviolent protests. And uh, well, he, his main focus was on desegregation, not integration. And there's a difference there. But during the 1960s, the men found themselves on two different sides of a growing, a growing rift between Dr. King's civil rights movement on the one hand and the nation of Islam's uh, turbulent vision of black power on the other hand. But the men had much in common. Both had grown up in the segregated South. So Dr. King in Atlanta, Georgia and um, uh, Muhammad Ali in Louisville, Kentucky. And I've actually been to the Muhammad Ali Museum in Louisville, Kentucky. I was speaking in Louisville back in 2000, either 12 or 2013. I, I was doing, I was speaking there with uh, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, who's in the Hidden Colors documentaries. He's one of my teachers. So we, we were doing a, a presentation together there in Louisville. It was actually a screening of Hidden Colors 2. Uh, uh, and we were uh, doing uh, questions and answers after the screening. And we went to the uh, Muhammad Ali Museum. Also, it's a fantastic museum there. They have with Ali. Uh, but the men had much in common. Both had grown up in the segregated South. They were arguably the two most famous uh, African-American men in America. Dr. King for his protests and preaching. Ali for his astonishing athleticism. And by the end of the 1960s, they were two of the most hated men in the United States. By the end of the 1960s, they were two of the most hated men in the United States. Racists branded them both with ugly stereotypes. They decried Dr. King's insistence on the dignity and worth of African-American men and his agitation uh, on behalf of the poor and derided, Dr. Uh, derided Muhammad Ali's insistence on black pride from his name change in 1964 uh, to his resistance to the Vietnam War as a white man's fight. Publicly, the men could not seem more opposed. Integration is wrong, Muhammad Ali said in 1964 when Dr. King was at the height of his visibility for nonviolent protests and calls to integrate or desegregate um, uh, uh, African American people into white society. And the, the real fight was we wanted first class citizenship. We wanted all of our rights now, we wanted equal access. OK, the, the fight, we, we weren't trying to give up our neighborhoods and give up our businesses and things like that. At the same time that you have the civil rights movement taking place, you also have the U.S. Interstate Highway Acts in 1952 and 1956 that are driving uh, thousands of miles of interstate highway throughout African-American communities, disrupting our communities, wiping out a lot of our homes, wiping out a lot of our businesses. This is at the same time that the civil rights movement is taking place. 
uh okay so yeah, check out this article here uh from biography.com meanwhile dr king repeatedly declined to engage with the nation of islam and turned down an invitation by malcolm x the nation of islam's most uh visible figure to march together quote i totally disagree with many of his political and philosophical views end quote dr king said later and uh, dr king turned down the uh opportunity that malcolm was inviting the civil rights leaders back in july 31st 1963 he was inviting them to a uh rally in harlem okay and, and dr king declined but february 24th 1966 dr king meets with who the honorable elijah muhammad dr king and coretta scott king go to elijah muhammad's house in chicago and dr king has a meeting with him now this is almost a year to the date after malcolm was assassinated okay this was february 24th 1966 all right so take uh, read this article here from biography i want to go to um uh the clip here from nbc news so uh may 8th 1967 uh nbc news did a interview with dr king at ebenezer baptist church in atlanta georgia the interviewer's name is sander van vancour uh, vanacour vanacour v-a-n-o-c-u-r and they're talking about a new phase in the civil rights movement and they're talking about after civil rights black power after civil rights black power let's go to this clip country is there something about nonviolence that made it and i use that in the past tense that made it more useful among southern negroes than the ghetto negroes of the north I wouldn't say there's uh, anything that makes it more useful to uh, Southern Negroes. I think it is true that uh, we've had more nonviolent movements in the South because uh, the problem for many years was more crystallized and, in a sense, more visible in the South. Uh, we didn't have many civil rights activities on a massive scale in the North until three or four years ago. So I would say that uh, we just haven't had a chance to experiment on a broad scale with nonviolence in the northern ghetto. I have the feeling that nonviolence is as applicable uh, and workable in the northern ghetto as it is uh, in the south. Uh, there's a larger job there. Uh, the frustrations at points are much deeper. The bitterness is deeper. And I think that's because in the South, we can see pockets of progress here and there. We've really made some strides that are very visible, and every Southern Negro knows that he can do things today that he couldn't do four or five years ago. Where and in the North, uh, the Negro sees only retrogress, uh, and he doesn't find it as easy to get his vision centered on his target, the target of opposition, as he does in the South. Consequently, this is made for despair and at many points cynicism, a feeling that you can't win. And it simply means that we've got to develop in the North a massive job of organization and mobilizing forces and resources to deal with the problem in the urban ghettos of the North, just as we've done it in the South. In the South, particularly in Alabama, you had visible villains, Jim Clark, Bull Connor, cattle prods police dogs. But in the North, you don't have those visible villains. Isn't it hard to get your people aroused and directed at something that isn't visible? Well, that's exactly right. And this is what I was saying when I said it's harder to see your target. Uh, in the South, in the nonviolent movement, we were aided always on the whole by the brutality of our opponents. Uh, it isn't the same way in the uh, north. The other thing is that you don't have legal segregation uh, in the north as you do in the south. So it is much more difficult to get people to see exactly what you're doing, but uh, it isn't an impossible job. It's, uh, it's a hard, it's a tedious job at times to get people to be aroused from their apathetic slumbers, but I still feel that uh, Negroes in the North can be motivated just as they were 
motivated in the South. And I think as time goes on with the growing economic deprivation in the Negro community, it will even be easier because people will come to see that not only is something wrong in general, but something is wrong in particular in their own economic and housing situation. What is it? How do you find it? Uh, it's very subtle in the North, is it not? It's subtle, but it's uh, becoming much more visible. Uh, it, uh, anybody can see that the schools are more segregated in the North today than they were in 1954 when the Supreme Court rendered its decision declaring segregation unconstitutional. Anybody can look around the ghetto and see that ghetto schools are predominantly segregated and devoid of quality. Anyone who moves to a major ghetto of our country will see the housing conditions. Uh, people don't have to be reminded that they are forced to live in slums in many instances, and they're often rat-infested vermin-filled slums. And they isn't too hard to see the exploitation that the Negro confronts in the ghetto, where he is forced to pay uh, more for less and constantly trying to make ends meet, but because of either no job as a result of unemployment, uh, a job that is so uh, economically unprofitable that the person can't make ends meet. And I think they see all of these things, and more and more they are coming to see them. Because before, the people of the North were looking to the South, and they supported the struggles of the South. Now they are coming to see that their problems are very real, and they've got organized to grapple with them. Was there something hypocritical about the fact that the South existed and the North could point the finger? And then when the Civil Rights Acts were passed in the early 60s, you couldn't point the finger anymore? Well, there was no doubt about the hypocrisy of uh, large segments of the nation on the whole question of racial equality. I think the best example is that many of the senators from the North and the West and congressmen generally who voted for civil rights legislation in 64 and even 65 of the voting rights bill refused last year to vote for civil rights legislation because it dealt with an issue applicable to the North, the whole housing question. And uh, this, it seems to me, was the greatest expression of the hypocrisy of uh, many of our citizens and many of the senators and congressmen of the North. But isn't that... Hey, 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 pa pa pause it right now? there. Uh, pause it right there, Jalen. The people knew that Negroes... Pause it right there. And you just back it up about 20 seconds. Okay, so what Dr. King is, is, is saying is that in 64, the Civil Rights Act of 64, and the vote on the Civil Rights Act in the U.S. Senate, after the filibuster was broken and you had uh, a lot of the Southern segregationist Democrats vote against it. Most of the Northern Democrats voted for it. All right. A lot of people don't make the distinction between those, those two. You had two factions, two main factions of the Democratic Party, just like you have multiple factions of the Democratic Party. Now you have the moderates, you have the progressives, um, you have establishment Democrats, things like that. You have factions then as well. What he's saying is, okay, they voted for the Civil Rights Act, the 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. But then when it came to um, fair housing in 66, right, they didn't vote for it. They voted against it. And then the other thing is he talks about, uh, there's a segment here where he talks about uh, some of those same people that voted for the civil rights bills being against um, a guaranteed income. OK, the guaranteed income that Andrew Yang was talking about when he was running for president in um, uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, that largely comes from Dr. King. And that was part of the poor people's campaign. That was an initiative of the poor people's campaign, a guaranteed income for poor people. Uh, but then also when we look at uh, 67 and we look at June of 67. The uh, Kerner Commission report, the Kerner Commission report that came out, it was it was commissioned in June of 67 by President Lyndon Johnson. But it comes out March of 68. OK, and it comes out a month before Dr. King's assassinated. 
uh, I've said this before, th th we should be pushing to have the Kerner Commission, the, the results of the Kerner, Kerner Commission report implemented. Because what it did was, it looked at what was the cause of the rebellions. It was, it was, it was a, a, a study designed to look at the cause of the rebellions that were taking place in cities across the country. African Americans in Detroit, Newark, New Jersey, things like this. The rebellions, what was the cause of the rebellions? Why were they happening? What can be done to change the conditions so they don't happen again, okay? We'll talk on the other side of the break, we'll talk some about that. I've dealt with the Kerner Commission report before. And a lot of times, when we have these discussions, um, the Kerner Commission, Kerner Commission report gets left out because it talked about the role that racism played and the resentment that a lot of white people had towards African Americans, and it dealt with poverty, poor schools, poor job, uh, uh, poor job opportunities, uh, uh, police brutality, as driving forces towards these racial explosions that were taking place and these rebellions that were taking place across the country. OK, and the the conclusion, their analysis and conclusion was on point. But President Johnson largely ignored the conclusions and did not implement them. But that, that's dealing with policy. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, pond resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. All this deals with policies. Policies bring about conditions. OK, I'm all for economic empowerment. This stuff, ain't, this, all this stuff is not because of lack of economic empowerment. It's an understanding of a chronology of history and laws that have been put in place. And it was it was policies and laws put in place that that, that also work to rob us of land, rob us of economic empowerment. OK, but the conditions are created by policies. When we deal with 246 years of slavery, we deal with the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, largely being locked out of things like the 1862 Homestead Act, which gave away almost 250 million acres of land from 1862 to 1988, being locked out of the, the uh, Southern Homestead Act of 1866, which gave away about 45 million acres of land, uh, largely being locked out of the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887. And that redistributed about 138 uh, million uh, acres of land as well. To, it was supposed to go largely to Native Americans and Black Indians, things like this. The Dawes Allotment Act, named after um, Senator Henry L. Dawes in Massachusetts. Two thirds of that land went to white people. That's where you get the whole five dollar Indian from. Two thirds of that land went to white people. OK, so understanding this, understand this chronology of history. And then when you deal with things like the. Uh, um, the. Uh, uh, the overtaxation, overassessment of uh, tax liability for properties for um, for land. Okay, this was one of the main ways that our land was taken away from us. Uh, tax assessors overassessing the tax liability or how much we have to pay in taxes for land that we own, farm land, things like this. And then when we can't pay the uh, inflated tax assessment, then we lose our land. All right. This is this is one of the tools that was used to rob us of our land. There was economic empowerment, but there were laws and policies that robbed us of that economic empowerment. And then there was also laws and policies that locked us out. For instance, when you deal with uh, uh, after the civil after the Civil War ends, and you deal with a lot of major labor unions being created, like the National Labor Union, 1866. And these labor unions are being created to lock African-Americans out of these skilled trades that we have been doing for free for 246 years because these labor unions were only for white men and, and, and various industries had to have contracts with these labor unions and that they, they, they could only hire white men to lock us out of these jobs because we there were at least 262 skills, trades and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865, okay? And then after slavery ends, now we can compete for these jobs. Now we're largely being locked out of these jobs and being then trying to lock us back into an agricultural basis and the sharecropping, things like this, and to keep us from competing for these jobs. Because our skill set, blacksmiths, coppersmiths, barrel makers, engineers, anchor makers, all different types of things like this, our skill set was as good as white people or in many cases even better than white people. OK, so it's understanding this chronology of history and the laws and policies that have been put in place to lock us into this condition. So that comes from understanding politics and law, okay? 
economic empowerment has its place, but we're not in this predicament because of economic empowerment. We're in this predicament because of laws and policies that create conditions and attack us. All right, we're coming up on a break. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break, and we'll um, uh, go back to this um, interview with uh, Dr. King after Civil Rights Black Power. This is from May 8th, 1967. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, Future Radio, Michael M. Hotel. And then also, um, uh, 910 AM welcomes former mayor of Flint, Michigan, Karen Weaver, the one and only Dr. Karen Weaver, to the airways starting Tuesday, January 19th. Karen Weaver will air Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's Dr. Karen Weaver. Call her by her correct name. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right. Stand by, everybody. Yeah, people are losing their home to high taxes. See, that's, see, that's historic. There was $600 million in overtax assessment here in Detroit. Thousands of people lost their homes right here just recently. It just The story just came out in 2020, I think it was, about the overtax assessment, $600 million. That's historic, okay? If you look at, um, there's an article from New York Times, Black People's Land Was Stolen. Black people's land was stolen. Um, and this deals with this history. I got a, a ton of information on this. This is from um, New York Times, June 20th, 2019, by Andrew W. Carl. And I've talked about it here on this show before. Okay. And this deals with the various ways. Uh, another, another method using the law is called uh, heirs' property. Heirs' property. And that's another way we lost a lot of our land like that we had in the South, okay? So this is all dealing with understanding law. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and a writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Okay, stand by one commercial break. Uh, okay. <laughs> For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has kept on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalil El Hakim is the founder of the Black History One on One Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought out public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NB Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black Street One-on-One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalil Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197. Or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101yahoo.com. bhistory101yahoo.com. With blackbusinesstea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business. Know your numbers and plan strategically. Black business boss lead your industry support black business encourage patronize and uplift one another blackbusinesstea.com currently has products sold in detroit atlanta chicago and los angeles with proceeds returned to the black community they have a wide selection of hoodies t-shirts mugs hats sweatshirts that support black owned businesses Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com.
Black Bees products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our now Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bees created a high quality, natural, organic per care line that would be affordable to everyone. We hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at cometicwear.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, January 17th, 2021. And we are live. It's Dr. King Day um, a weekend, and everybody's going to be selling, celebrating Dr. King Day and talking about how he just wanted everybody to love everybody. He was a man of peace and things like that. They're not going to deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. They're not going to talk about the Dr. King. Most likely, they won't talk about the Dr. King that met with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad February 24th, 1966. They won't talk about the Dr. King who had a secret friendship with Muhammad Ali. They won't talk about the Dr. King who in 1957 went to the celebration of Ghana's independence and he went to meet with Kwame Nkrumah. And then each year on the anniversary of Ghana's independence, he goes back to Ghana. They won't talk about the Dr. King that studied the, um, uh, the independence movement, the African independence movement on the continent of Africa as well, because the civil rights movement was happening concurrently with the African independence movement as well. And they were learning from one another. OK, they're watching our uh, struggle. and we're, we're watching theirs. Uh, so right before the break, I, I talked about 262 skills, trades and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. And how after the Civil War ended, you have a lot of these major labor unions created. You have a uh, American Federation of Labor created about uh, it's about spread right around 1875, something like that. And these are labor unions created for white people, white men. And they're designed to lock African Americans out of these jobs that we have been doing for free for 246 years. So at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, and the call in number is 313 778 7600. 313 778 7600. It's a call in number. We'll go to the phone lines in just a, in a few minutes here. At the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, there's a display when you go through the main exhibit and still we rise, you go through the replica of the slave ship, and then you know you they have statues of different periods of time dealing with history and dealing pertaining to slavery. And you, you'll see Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, things like this. There's a, there's a uh, display on the wall and it lists the 262 skills, trades and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. Okay. Um, and that information comes from a book called uh, the other slaves the uh, uh, the other slaves and uh, mechanics, artisans and craftsmen by um, James E. Newton and Ronald Lewis, James E. Newton and Ronald Lewis. And it, that book came out in 1978. OK. Um, so. The so what happened was there's a there was a sign up above the, the display. And it said, you can't take pictures, right? So I went home, got a pen and a pad, came back, and I spent an hour writing them down, and I numbered them. That's how I know the 262, and here's a copy of it, okay? 
I was looking for this a few days ago. It was in another one of my file folders. I made different copies of this. But, the, you know, we were anchor makers. We were artists, bakers, barkers, barrel makers, bartenders, basket makers, beer makers, blacksmiths, boarding housekeepers, uh, boat corkers, boat men, bonnet pressers, book binders, boot blacks. Boot, boot blacks are uh, shoe shine, people who shine shoe, shoe shine. OK, that's what uh, Dick Rowland was. Dick Rowland, when you deal with the um, Tulsa massacre, uh, June 1st, uh, 1921, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street and Dick Rowland and Sarah Page. And there were allegations that Dick Rowland sexually assaulted Sarah Page or, or assaulted her or what have you. He, he was a boot black. OK, he was a shoe shine man. Uh, Breaksmen, brass founders, brewers, bricklayers, brick makers, bridal makers, brush makers. They have it in alphabetical order. Carpet cleaners, uh, carriage makers, carvers, caterers, caulkers, chain makers, chair makers, chimney sweepers, uh, clipboard carpenters, clergymen, clerks, cloak, make, cloak makers, cloth makers, clothiers, cigar makers, coachmen, coach painters, cobblers, coffin makers, collectors, confectioners, confectioners, you know, make candy, especially chocolates, make candy, uh, cooks. Coppersmiths, uh, content gin makers, content gin makers. So the content gin right around 1793, uh, Eli Whitney. Then you have copies of the cotton gin uh, as well. Content gin makers, um, uh, uh, cracker bakers, uh, crafts instructors, uh, Degore typers. The Degore type was the first photographic camera named after John Degore type. And it was... The Degore type was uh, created in the eighteen, the, the late eighteen twenties, about eighteen twenty six, and then is going to be available for commercial usage in about the eighteen thirties. The Degore type, okay. Uh, decorative furnishers, uh, distillers, domestics, draftsmen, dressmakers, uh, druggist assistants at like pharmacies, dyers embroiderers, engine builders, engineers, engravers, finisher, finishers, fishermen, flower inspectors. You get the idea. So when I, I, I see movies and depictions of African-Americans as, as slaves and they just show us picking cotton, you know, I'm like, uh, <laughs> that did happen. But it's like, come on now. Okay, you trying to. <laughs> You trying to water, you trying to pull the cotton over our eyes. That, no, that's not all we did. No. <laughs> we built the White House, the US Capitol building. Those were skills tradesmen. Th those were you had enslaved African, enslaved Africans, as well as free African Americans and some white people. Uh that gonna build the US Capitol building. Uh there's a book, um, the the black man who built the White House, I think it is. I have it in the other room. Uh, but yeah, so I'm like, I, 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 I see, you know, this information and these reenactments and they just show us picking, picking cotton and stuff like that. I'm like, uh, <laughs> all right, <laughs> that's, the, that's the game you want to run. Uh, <laughs> the black man, the, uh, the black man, uh, black men built the capital. Black men built the capital, C-A-P-I-T-O-L, discovering African-American history in and around uh, Washington, D.C. And the layout of Washington, D.C. was done by Benjamin Banneker, another man of African descent. OK, <laughs> and the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of the layout of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, which was built by African people. OK, <laughs> so wherever you go, that's where we are. You can't run away from yourself. Even though many of us try and our legs should be tired of running away from ourselves. But you read uh, uh, Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. So we can we can connect. We can connect the building of the U.S. Capitol by African men. And then the layout of Washington, D.C., where the U.S. Capitol is by Benjamin Banneker. OK, and using science and understanding astronomy. And then and, and the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of the layout of ancient Egypt built by African people as well. Okay, <laughs> what you what you want to say? Slaves just pick cotton and cook masses food. <laughs>
right. <laughs> I, I, I guess you think the South won the war, and uh, uh, <laughs> and you still believe in the tooth fairy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Uh, let's go back to this. Uh, well, let's see. Let's go quickly to the phone lines. Uh, who we have here on uh, line one? We still uh, we still have Wadsworth line one. Hey, hey, Wadsworth, how you doing? Hey, okay, I think I think he has a bad connection. I think Wadsworth has a bad connection. Okay, that sounds clear. Go ahead. Okay, he has a, he has a bad. Hey, hey Jalen, help him out with his connection. It's a bad connection. It sounds like he's underwater. We'll come back to him. We'll come back to Wadsworth in, in just a minute here. We'll try to. It, it sounds like he's underwater. I can't understand what he's saying. Um, let's do this. In the meantime, um, I, I want to go back to this clip here. This is from May eighth, nineteen sixty seven. Doctor King is being interviewed by Sander Vanaker for NBC News. This interview is called After Civil Rights. Black power. Let's go back to this clip. Okay, hold on. Okay, hold on, hold on, Jalen. This is uh okay. Play, play it on your end. I'm gonna call back in because it's, it's it's a bad connection somewhere. I'm gonna disconnect and call back into the station, Jalen. I, I can't even understand the clip now. Something happened. Let me disconnect and I'll call right back. All right, stand by everybody. Uh, hold on, this is live radio. We're broadcasting remotely. And something happened, the clip was playing well right before the break, I don't know. <clears throat> stand by. All right, Jalen, can you hear me? Okay, all right, okay, all right. Uh, let's go back to the clip, Jalen, thank you. Okay. I think the dilemma is much deeper. Enough. Uh, one during this period of transition has to be very honest with America. And honesty impels me to admit that America has a uh, broad racist element still alive. Racism is still uh, existing in American society in many areas of the society, North and South. And the other thing is that there has never been a single solid, determined commitment of large segments of white America on the whole question of racial equality. Uh, I think we have to see that vacillation has always existed, ambivalence has always existed, and this to me is the so-called white backlash. It's merely a new name for an old phenomenon. I see the white backlash as a continuation of the same ambivalence and vacillation of white America and the whole question of racial justice that ex has existed uh, since the founding of our nation. I think the other thing that uh, we must see at this time is that many of the people who supported us in Selma, in Birmingham, were really outraged about the extremist behavior toward Negroes. But they were not at that moment, and they are not now, committed to genuine equality for Negroes. It's Woo! much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee an annual income, for instance, to get rid of poverty for Negroes and all poor people. It's much easier to integrate a bus uh, than it is to make genuine integration a reality and quality education a reality in our schools. It's much easier to integrate even a public park, than it is to get rid of slums. And I think we are in a new era, a new phase of the struggle, where we have moved from a struggle for decency, which characterized our struggle for 10 or 12 years, to a struggle for genuine equality. And this is where we are getting the resistance, because there was never any intention uh, to go this far. People were reacting to Bull Connor and to Jim Clark, rather than acting in good faith for the realization of genuine equality. Hey, Do you hey, think pa pa pause right there, Jalen. Hey, pause right there. Back that up for about a minute. Back it up for about a minute. He said, Dr. King said there was never really, there was never 
really a genuine intent by white people for African Americans to have full equality. They'll integrate a lunch counter. They'll desegregate the buses. He said, but they, he's basically saying they weren't ready for how far we were going to push this thing. They never intended to have full equality. And this is why I say when you go study the civil rights movement and even before the modern day civil rights movement, which is looked at as starting with the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, uh, December uh, 5th, 1955, and the arrest of Rosa Parks, December 1st, 1955. And then some people market, some people start the modern day civil rights movement with the lynching, uh, lynching of Emmett Till, August 28th, 1955, in Money, Mississippi, right? Even you go back before then, you go back to when African American soldiers are coming back home from World War I. We were fighting for first class citizenship and all of our rights now. You had what was known as the new Negro, okay? And we wanted, we, we, we were saying, we're not com coming back to Jim Crow and, and the segregation. We want all of our rights now. When when brothers came back home from World War II, like Megar Evers. Megar Evers was in Normandy uh, uh, on D-Day, okay? Uh, June uh, 6, 1944, I think it was, uh, uh, on D-Day. Mega Evers, he was one of the almost 2,000 African American soldiers uh, who, who uh, landed there in uh, Normandy, in Normandy, France. Okay. So when Mega Evers comes back home, he gets involved in the civil rights movement. Okay. Yeah, June 6, 1944. I was correct. Uh, and and, and Mega Evers, uh, the field secretary for the NAACP in, in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, organizes uh, uh, boy, uh, boycotts and things like this. But when these African-American soldiers come back, we want all of our rights now. We want first class citizenship. OK. Um, let's do this. We have Wadsworth back. Let's go back to the phone lines because Wadsworth. Uh, hey, 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 Wadsworth, thanks for calling back in. Thanks for holding. Uh, uh, tell us where you're calling from. Go ahead with your question or comment. I'm from South, South Michigan. Is it, is this a good question for you? Yeah go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I can hear you. Thanks okay. for calling back. Okay. I I, I have two comments for you, and, and I got one question for you. Okay, okay go ahead. Now, now my comments are now my comments are uh, not because because you know I'm part of the, I'm part of the, like the deaf media the sign language uh, community. Yeah, and, and, deaf and, media and, sign language community. Yeah, go ahead. And, 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 and we had and we had to leave from we had to leave from one organization, the, the Deaf Church TV, because they were, I mean, because this network was. was was uh, but when it, when it comes to news, it, 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 whatever came out of Trump's mouth, it, they, 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 they treated it as the gospel. So we have to get away from that. Okay. So, 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 so and, 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 and we have a brother, or we have a young brother, his name is Monte. He's he also on YouTube, and and this this guy is is, is, is like a young, it's like a young youth. I mean, he he. he he is very sharp. I, I mean, if you if you watch on YouTube, okay, this guy is like a young Michael Bryan type. Okay. And, and now my question. And now my question. What, what's it? What's his name? What's his name? Uh, Monte M O N D T A E. Okay. And, and he's Monte. He's on YouTube every, every, every week. Okay. I mean every day. Okay. You check him out. Okay. Okay. And, and my question. Is, my question is this. My question is this. Let, 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 now we know the Republicans. The back back in the day, the Republicans were for the were for the black people because they wanted to, they, they freed the slaves. Then the Democrats wanted to save on us. And, and now today, the Democrats are like the ones who who are helping the black people, and then the Republicans are the ones who are trying to keep us keep us down. But but there are some people that say that that today the Democrats are still like the slave owners and the Republicans. Are, are still like the heroes, but I, I want to ask you: what, has that has that changed, or, or, is, it, or is it is it still, or, or, or is it still the same? Or, or, or there was a party realignment. There was a party realignment that starts with the Lily White movement in 1928, which was the effort of Republicans to get Herbert Hoover elected as president in 1928. They instituted a Southern strategy to target five former Confederate states and appeal to the 
uh, Southern segregationist Democrats in those five former Confederate states to get them to vote for Herbert Hoover as president. Herbert Hoover wins the 1928 presidency. He uh, and, and the Lily White movement was a movement to ignore the needs and concerns of African-Americans and to push us out of the Republican Party. Many people think that African-Americans switched to the Democratic Party because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. That's not true. By 1960, two thirds of African-Americans had already switched to the Democratic Party because you got to go back decades before that. And this in this in the shift started happening with the 1928 presidential election. And there was a rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. Republicans are, are starting to ignore that. This is during the uh, first two decades of the Great Migration and more African-Americans are migrating from the south up north. And more of us, more of us are being able to vote also. So we start slowly going over to the Democratic Party. President uh, Franklin Roosevelt wins the 1932 presidential election. Uh, Herbert Hoover mishandles the uh, Great Depression, which is uh, precipitated by the October uh, 1929 stock market crash. Herbert uh, uh, President uh, Roosevelt wins the presidential election in 32. African Americans are leery of the Democratic Party, but they are more. They, they find Hoover, uh, they find Roosevelt to be more receptive, but also they like his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. So over the, the subsequent years, more and more, more and more of us go over to the Democratic Party because they were more receptive to our needs. The 1947-1948 presidential election, the Democrats have a pro-civil rights agenda, okay, in opposition to Republicans, all right? And then today, all you got to do is look at policy. All you, we deal with policy on the show. All you have to do is look at policy at the federal, at the national level, the federal level, House of Representatives, U.S. Senate, the policies of Democrats, okay, in general, not every single policy, but in general, are more beneficial to African Americans than policy of Republicans. Look, who, look who's blocking raising the federal minimum wage from $7.25 to $15 an hour. That's Republicans. That passed the House of Representatives in uh, like June or July 2019. OK, when you deal with things like uh, the, uh, the, the George Floyd uh, Police and Justice Act, who blocked that in the Senate? It was Republicans. This passed the House of Representatives. When you go across the board, you look at environmental racism, you look at making college affordable, you look at uh, relieving uh, college debt. You, all you got to do is just look at the debate over of coronavirus stimulus checks. Who was blocking that? Mitch McConnell didn't even want to take that up. Mitch McConnell. Oh, we got to go to break. Stand by. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Intuitive Design Clothing is an online accessory store that sells one of a kind signature statement pieces for men and women. They also specialize in fashion consultations, closet organization, and decorating small spaces. Are you looking for a statement piece for a special affair, or would you like to add some select pieces to your ensemble of accessories? If you're looking for something different, definitely contact Kathy Norman, owner and CEO of Intuitive Design Clothing. Visit their website, intuitivedesignclothing.com. That's intuitivedesignclothing.com, and you can email her at info at intuitivedesignclothing.com. Intuitive Design Clothing is where Every entrance is a grand entrance. Soul Natural Beauty Products offers organic, plant-based skin and hair care products that will rejuvenate skin and naturally grow and thicken hair. Their whipped shea butter can heal or restore damaged skin cells to prevent hyperpigmentation and skin breakouts. All products are made with organic, plant-based ingredients. Their maximum hair growth oil is fortified with organic herbal extracts and undeniably proves that Mother Nature knows best. It thickens, lengthens, softens, and conditions all types of hair. They even guarantee hair improvement within 90 days or a full refund. Their all-natural 24-hour deodorant leaves the body smelling fresh without sweating for up to 24 hours. It does not stain fabric, goes on smoothly, and has a refreshing lavender and frankincense aroma. 
It can be used by men, women, and even children. Place your order today at soulnaturalbeautyproducts.com. That's soulnaturalbeautyproducts.com. And follow them on Facebook at Soul Natural Beauty Products. With blackbusinesstea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business, know your numbers, and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business, encourage, patronize, and uplift one another. Blackbusinesstea.com currently has products sold in Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles with proceeds returned to the black community. They have a wide selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, hats, sweatshirts that support black owned businesses. Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com. Do you have an idea or business that requires app development or thinking of moving your IT resources to the cloud? We have postpaid and profit sharing plans for unique ideas or profitable businesses. Who can take advantage of this unique program? Entrepreneurs with unique ideas, startups, small to medium businesses. Contact us, 267-209-0352. Visit nomadicsystems.net, nomadicsystems.net today. For 25 years, Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid Hakim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum. And he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop, and race relations. Dr. Khalid named among the change makers for NBC Brussels Race the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History 101 Mo Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197. Or visit their website, blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com. bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Somebody said LBJ redlining. Redlining goes back to 1937. Redlining, redlining was created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which was created by 1934. Okay. That's under President Roosevelt redlining we see redlining in the 60s but that goes back to 1937 stand stand by everybody all right we're coming back for the last segment we got to wrap this up okay african-american business owners um post name your business here on the thread of the broadcast we'll let you know how you can advertise with the african history network email us at customer service at African History Network.com, customer service at African History Network.com. Stand by, we're on, we're on commercial break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. We're going to get through some more of this stuff on Monday's show. I got a ton of information for y'all. I haven't even gotten through, damn. I haven't even gotten through one quarter, 20, I haven't even gotten through 20% of this information. I was just pulling stuff together because <laughs> I have a I have a ton of information on Dr. King. I haven't even gotten to the uh, eight page article I've written on Dr. King. We we'll have to do that Monday night. <laughs> we have to do a whole week. <laughs> we have to have to do a whole week. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on nine ten a on the Superstation of Future Radio on Michael M Hotel. It is Sunday, January seventeenth, twenty twenty one. It is. Uh, Dr. King Day weekend. We know Dr. King Day is coming up. 
Uh, I want to remind you all that uh, starting on Tuesday, January 19th, 2021, Dr. Karen Weaver, former mayor of Flint, Michigan, uh, will start her show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation WFDF. You can listen to her Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so we call her Mayor Dr. Karen Weaver. OK, she has a doctorate. She was a psychologist, if I remember correctly. And um, they need to send her to Washington and deal with some of those crazy ass people in Washington. She has a psychology degree, but <laughs> but uh, listen to uh, Doctor Mayor Doctor Karen Weaver. All right, hey, if you like this type of information, also you can donate to the African History Network. Dollar sign the A H N show through Cash App. Dollar sign the A H N show through Cash App, and also through PayPal. PayPal dot me forward slash the A H N show. Or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It helps us keep broadcasting six days a week because uh, we have Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You know, throughout the day, we rebroadcast a lot of these shows and a lot of my presentations on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. So we do rebroadcast throughout the day. And then um, these shows are an audio podcast format also. At uh, if you go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, click on listen to podcasts. We're on nine different podcast platforms, including iHeartRadio, uh, Castbox, FM Player, TuneIn. Uh, so it, wherever you get your podcast from, search for uh, the African History Network show. Uh, the African History Network show, also wherever you get your uh, podcast from. Okay, uh, we're going to go back to Wadsworth for a quick minute. I got to wrap up with Wadsworth and then get back to this because as I was saying during the break. Uh, as I was saying during, uh, hold on just a second, Roswell. As I was saying during the break, I got so much information here, Dr. King. I've only gotten through like 20, barely gotten through 20% of the information I have. So we're going to continue with some of this throughout the week, okay? But go ahead, Wildsworth, with your last comment. <laughs> My last comment is this, uh, Mike Michael. If you're not, I don't know if you're, if you're aware of this, but, 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 but if you know about Byron, I, but Byron Allen, he just posted. He just posted his right TV uh, um, for, for, for NGM TV. <laughs> the Grio, the Grio TV, Byron Allen, the Grio TV. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've talked about it here on this show. Uh, now he has that network, and to, to, to put, uh, you can watch that network. Uh, see, I'm, uh, I'm a part of that. I'm part of that. I'm part of that network. Uh, 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 and I, I'm so excited to, to help promote that network in the short, in the short area because it's on 3.1 that there is in the choice. Right. And, and, and now, now, Wildsworth, I, I don't know if we are supposed to use this station to promote that. I, I, I don't know. Okay, because usually they don't do that. <laughs> but, but I get your point, though. It's so awesome that he's. It's, it's so awesome that we have one black, black, um, we have one black person that that that, that, that actually doing something that. Right. That, 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 that no, he's doing some good things. Yeah, yeah. We share articles from thegrio.com here, and uh, I, I've talked about him launching his network. He has April Ryan as a White House correspondent, also. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, Wadsworth. Call back tomorrow night. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, check out the articles from thegrio.com as well. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, let me get this other call quickly here. We've got Willie, uh, Willie Line 2. Willie, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for holding. Tell us where you're calling from, Willie. Hey, uh, Mr. Uh, Emma Pep, and yeah. uh, good Sunday night. Um, I'm calling you from the from the Motor City, okay. a.k.a. Troy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, <laughs> hey, I'm really... You can tell I'm really enjoying your program tonight oh, thank you. about uh, the great Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, but you reminded me of something. Uh, 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 you know, I saw years ago on another journalist program. Okay. His, pro he, you know, his program was TV, mm -hmm. and uh, he was just like yourself. You know, he would really bring, you know, information. Was that was that Tony Brown? That the media passes over. Was that? No, um, uh, his name was Mr. Hodel. He was on TV 33. 
Okay. This was some years back. Oh, hold on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I wanted I wanted to know if you had did you have any information on or know about um there was a uh afternoon um T V talk show host here named Mike Douglas. And he interviewed Martin Luther King. You know, oh, you talking about the T V show. You talking about the T V show. Right. The Mike Douglas show. Right. Yeah, I remember the Mike Douglas show. That's from the nineteen seventies. Yeah. I remember the Mike Douglas show. Oh, okay. <laughs> man, I haven't heard of Mike Douglas in years, man. <laughs> no, but this is, this, this is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, Mr. Hodel showed a clip mm -hmm. where Mike Douglas interviewed Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, you know, it's been some years back. My I've seen that clip. Foggy, but... Yeah, I've seen that clip. Mm -hmm. I've seen that clip. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's on YouTube. You know it. It's on YouTube. Okay. Well, great then. Okay. I have to check it out, but I was I, I do believe the subject was similar mm -hmm. to what you're discussing tonight about um you know uh how um MLK and the civil rights movement, you know, he was it was about empowerment of black people here yeah. in America. So yeah, he was. That's what I wanted to know. Yep. Okay, man. Keep listening. Thanks, Willie. Thanks for calling in, okay? Okay, and have a good night now. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to go back to this uh, clip here, and I have some other information to share with you. So we're going to have to deal with this throughout the week. I didn't even want to talk about Trump tonight. I, I mean, I got a lot, a lot of information. I had to do radio six days a week. I studied this stuff 24-7. We dealt with that all last week, you know, and then impeachment and everything and U.S. Capitol attack. We'll deal with a little bit more of that Monday, however much I can bear. You know, I got a ton of information on that. But uh, we're going to – we'll probably – Deal with Dr. King all throughout the uh, this coming week also. But let's go back to this clip. This is from May 8th, 1967. It's an interview with NBC News with Dr. King at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. It's called After Civil Rights, Black Power. Let's go back to this clip. Of the extremist behavior toward Negroes, but they were not at that moment, and they are not now, committed to genuine equality for Negroes. It's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee an annual income, for instance, to get rid of poverty for Negroes and all poor people. It's much easier to integrate a bus uh, than it is to make genuine integration a reality and quality education a reality in our schools. It's much easier to integrate even a public park than it is to get rid of slums. And I think we are in a new era, a new phase of the struggle, where we have moved from a struggle for decency, which characterized our struggle for 10 or 12 years, to a struggle for genuine equality. And this is where we're getting the resistance because there was never any intention uh, to go this far. People were Ooh. reacting to Bull Connor and to Jim Clark rather than acting in good faith for the realization of genuine equality. Do you think white people in this country, and I'm talking about non-segregationists, people devoid, thinking they're devoid of racism, do you have any idea of what they want the Negro to be in America? Well, it depends on the level that we are talking here, uh, because I think you have to make a distinction between the people who are genuinely and absolutely committed in the white community on the question of of racial equality. And I must confess that I think they're in a very small minority. I think the vast majority of white Americans uh, will go but so far. It's a kind of installment plan for equality. And uh, they are always looking for an excuse uh, to go but so far. Why are they looking for the excuse? What is it about the Negro? I mean, every other group that came as an immigrant somehow, not easily, but somehow got around it. Is it just the fact that Negroes are black? That's a part of it. And growing, that grows out of something else. You can't thingify anything without depersonalizing that something. If you use something as a means to an end, at that moment you make it a thing and you depersonalize it. Mm -hmm. The fact is that the Negro was a slave in this country for 244 years. That act, uh, that was uh, a willful thing that was done. The Negro was brought here and changed, treated in very human fashion. 
And this led to the thingification of the Negro. So he was not looked upon as a person. He was not looked upon as a human being with the same uh, status and worth as other human beings. And the other thing is that human beings cannot continue to do wrong without eventually uh, rationalizing that wrong. So mm -hmm. slavery was justified morally, biologically, uh, theoretically, scientifically, everything else. And it seems to me that white America must see that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. Uh, that is one thing that other immigrant groups haven't had to face. The other thing is that the color became a stigma. American society made the Negroes' color a stigma. And uh, that can never be uh, overlooked. So I think these things are absolutely necessary. The other thing is that America freed the slaves in 19, I mean 1863 through the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln, but gave the slaves no land or nothing in reality, and as a matter of fact, to, to get started on. At the same time, America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that there was a willingness to give the white peasants from Europe an economic base. And yet it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked free for 244 years any kind of economic base. And so emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom uh, to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate, and therefore it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't, oh, they don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. But uh, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And many Negroes, by the thousands and millions, have been left bootless as a result of all of these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading. Apart from wanting to live better, which all of us want to do, to raise one's children in a better way, to be better, does the Negro in America know what he wants to be? I'm convinced that uh, almost every Negro in this country, other than those who have been so scarred by the system that they've become pathological in the process, and we all have to battle with pathology, and nobody really knows what it means uh, to be a Negro unless one can really experience it. And I know we all have to battle with this constant drain of uh, a feeling of nobodiness. But in spite of this, uh, I think the vast majority of Negroes in this country know that they want to be people. They want to be men. They want equality, period. It just boils down to that. And we haven't been able to be people. We haven't been men because of all of the uh, conditions that we've lived with and the syndrome of deprivation surrounding conditions, whether it's in housing or in the economic area or in schools or in the vicious credit practices that we face in the ghetto and all of the problems of closed doors and constant defeats. But uh, in spite of all this, I think we all know uh, basically that we want to be men. We want to be persons judged not on the basis of the color of our skin, but on the basis of the content of our character. Did you know hey, that hey, many pa pa young Pause it right there. Pause it right there, Jalen. Pause it right there. All right. So that is from uh, NBC News. That is uh, called After Civil Rights, Black Power. That's from May 8th, 1967. May 8th, 1967. It is on um, NBC's website. Um, it's on NBC News website and it's on their YouTube channel uh, also, okay? So we'll post this link here. We'll share some more of that uh, on tomorrow's show. Uh, I, I want to go to this other clip. We're going to go to uh, Dr. King's speech on economic justice, Jalen, just a second. Um, so 
one of the things Dr. King was talking about in that interview and other interviews and speeches is how even white people who supported the civil rights movement in 64 and 65, and they were, uh, they, 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 they felt horrible about uh, uh, Bloody Sunday, okay, March 7th, 1965, and the attack on John Lewis and, and civil rights leaders, and they were horrified by uh, Bull Connor in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, things like this, and the dogs and the water hoses. They were horrified by that. So they supported the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. But then when it comes to economic issues, now that's where they draw the line, many of them. That's where they draw the line. And Dr. King was saying they're not, they're not committed to what it is in full that we want. Um, I talked about the Kerner Commission report, which is extremely, extremely important. You can tie the Kerner Commission report into the report that came out about September 2020 from Citibank that dealt with how the U.S. economy had lost $16 trillion in 20 years from the year 2000 to the year 2020 because of racism and African-Americans being uh, uh, locked out of, uh, because of racism, less African-Americans being able to attain a college degree, buy a home, or get a bank loan to start a business. And the impact the negative impact it had on the overall economy. And it also showed the impact that racism has on white people who think that racism, many of them think that it benefits them because racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. And racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, benefits, privileges, land access to education, access to opportunity, et cetera. And they use that to marginalize, subordinate, and do harm to another race of people. So uh, we, you know, it's a whole presentation I've done dealing with um, um, how racism has cost the U.S. economy $16 trillion in 20 years. And we re-air that on the African History Network periodically. Um, so if we look at the current commission report, blackpast.org, B-L, uh, P-A-S-T, blackpast.org has an article, 1967 National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. And very quickly, we'll talk about this uh, throughout the week also. Uh, they, they talk about the Kerner Commission, which was commissioned uh, by President Lyndon Johnson, July 28, 1967. It was actually the day after the Detroit Rebellion of 67 ended. And the Kerner Commission was designed to um, answer three questions. It was, uh, they wanted to look at uh, what caused the, uh, the three questions were what happened, why did it happen, and what can be done to prevent racial disturbance in the future? What happened, why did it happen? And what can be done to uh, prevent racial disturbance in the future? In order to answer these three questions, the Kerner Commission, it was named after Governor Otto Kerner of Illinois. That's where it, it comes from. That's the ostensible name, Kerner Commission. The, the actual name was the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. So what they did was they surveyed 23 cities across the U.S. And they were looking at the rebellions that took place from 1964 to 1967. OK. And uh, the commission surveyed 23 cities across the nation which experienced a racial rebellion. They found that the racial disturbances were not the result of a single triggering event, but that in all cities surveyed, African-Americans experienced severe economic and social disadvantages compared to white. Severe economic and social disadvantages compared to white. So we look at, uh, you know, before the break, we, I was talking about um, Republicans blocking $2,000 stimulus checks, okay? Republicans not wanting to make a full commitment to fight coronavirus that disproportionately negatively impacts African-Americans. And all you have to do is look at, at Mitch McConnell. Back during the summer of 2020, he let the uh, U.S. Senate go on a recess for uh, one month, they hadn't passed a coronavirus bill. 
Okay, they had because the because Democrats passed the three point four trillion dollar Heroes Act in May. It was May fifteenth, twenty twenty. It goes to the Senate and it died in the Senate. And then uh, McConnell uh, McConnell let the uh, the Senate go on a recess for a, a month. The six hundred dollars in in uh, six hundred dollars a week in federal unemployment insurance was set to expire July 31st, 2020. Everybody knew that. They didn't pass a coronavirus bill in the Senate to uh, match the uh, HEROES Act passed in the House by Democrats. The unemployment insurance expires. That runs out. The, the $600 a week in federal unemployment insurance wears out. Then they had time to get Amy Coney Barrett confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court. In eight days, because Donald Trump thought that would help him steal the election in the U.S. Supreme Court. The day after they got Amy Coney Barrett confirmed, Mitch McConnell sends the, the U.S. Senate on another recess. And they still hadn't passed a coronavirus bill. Okay? So then you look at this, and then you look at who keeps blocking this. Now, the issues I have with Democrats, but I study policy, and their policies are much more in general at the federal level, national level in general, much more beneficial than African-Americans, for African-Americans than Republicans. And at the same time, uh, you look at who is trying to disenfranchise the African-American vote. Because all this, all, all this turns on the vote. Policies are put, in the, uh, put in place by people who write laws, but they're voted in office. Or they're appointed by somebody who's, who was voted in the office. This is why in Georgia, this is why in 1963 in, in Georgia, and Dr. King was born in Atlanta, Georgia, Denmark Groover, state representative segregationist Denmark Groover in 1963 implemented the runoff, the, the statewide runoff race. And that statewide runoff race was designed to lock African Americans out of statewide power, statewide positions, governor, senator, secretary of state, things like that. And you, we've talked we've talked about that here on this show, and we'll probably deal with that some more tomorrow night. But the reason why they implemented it was because they said that if African Americans put all their weight behind one African American candidate and they win, like say for U.S. Senate in the primary, then if nobody gets 50% or more of the vote, then you have to go to a runoff race between the two top vote getters. So if, if, if African Americans put all their weight behind one African American candidate in the primaries and that, and that African American candidate wins and you have multiple white people running in the primaries and they split the white vote, they gave white people the opportunity to have a do over in the runoff race and then all white people, regardless of political affiliation, Republican, Democrat, independent, whatever, could all vote for that one white candidate to defeat the African-American candidate because they have a numerical majority. White people in Georgia have a numerical majority. This is why I was put in place. So Reverend Raphael Warnock defeated that, 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 that runoff race law that was put in place and advocated by, by a segregationist designed to lock African-Americans out of statewide political power in Georgia. And not only that, Reverend Raphael Warnock beat Senator Kelly Loeffler twice because he got 32 percent of the vote in the primary. He got he got a higher percentage than she did in the primary and he beat her again in the general election. So what Reverend Raphael Warnock did with the help of Stacey Abrams and and Latasha Brown and all the activists and things like that, that was not supposed to happen. This is one of the reasons why those white supremacist domestic terrorists on January 6th, this is one of the reasons why they were so upset. It wasn't just the presidential election. It's what went down in Georgia. African-Americans rose up, and Georgia is a former Confederate state. And, 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 and white people in Georgia took up arms to fight against the Union to maintain slavery. That wasn't supposed to happen. But it did. Okay, uh, I want to go to this last clip here. 
This is Dr. King. This is 1968. Uh, Dr. King in 1968 uh, spoke at a church in Mississippi. Now, remember, February 24th, 1966, he meets with Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But in this speech here at the church in Mississippi, he puts the fight for land and the need for land front and center. Let's go to this clip, Jalen. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges, the government money, teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents for their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farm. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. This is what we are faced with, and this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. Okay, okay, pause it, pause it right there. Pause it right there. Okay, so that was so the campaign he's talking about. People think he's talking about reparations. He's not talking about reparations. He's talking about the poor people's campaign. This is why you got to understand context. He was just pulled just stuff out the. He's talking about the poor people's campaign. This is 1968, early 1968. Okay, so th this is what this is what Dr. King is talking about. Okay, people just try to just make stuff up, you know. But he said we're coming to get our check. He's talking about laws and policies and how laws and policies were used to lock African Americans out of land giveaways, massive land giveaways that that then. Uh, allowed white people to acquire land and have assets to pass on to future generations. All right. Uh, so look at check out the um, research, the Homestead Act of 1862, uh, history.com, official website of the History Channel. They have an article there dealing with the Homestead Act, Homestead Act of 1862, and then also uh, research the Southern Homestead Act of uh, 1866. Uh, read the uh, read the article, read, read the book, How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy, as well, How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy. And they talk about Dr. King in that speech uh, from 1968 in Mississippi on page 74 of the third edition, page 74 of the third edition. I just sent you an email, Jalen. Uh, we're going to go to that clip uh, next year. We're going to squeeze that in. Um, so I, I talked about Georgia and um, Reverend Raphael Warnock, okay? And uh, also, some of, you, some of you all know Reverend Raphael Warnock is receiving death threats. And, and one of the people, uh, one of the people who uh, was arrested uh, at the U.S. Uh, Capitol during that uh, insurrection, one of those domestic terrorists, uh, threatened uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock. So news1.com has an article, Proud Boys member denied bail after threatening to kill, after threatening to kill Reverend, uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock. Okay. This is from January 15th, 2021. And it talks about here, um, uh, let's see, Eduardo Flore Floria, a member of the white supremacist group was detained in Queens, New York on Tuesday with over 1000 rounds of ammunition after police uncovered Floria's a uh, post on Parler, the, white, the social media platform Parler, favored by white uh, nationalists, as reported by the Wa uh, Wall Street Journal. So he said, F. Rob Reverend Raphael Warnock, loser. Uh, Floria responded to another user on the site under the name of, uh, okay, long, uh, did, uh, okay, so they made some type of threat to him. Um, Though authorities do not believe Floria attended the riot on January 6th, his intentions were made clear through his parlor uh, post. Now, they also mentioned this other idiot, uh, Jacob Anthony Chansley, 
and uh, he's asking for a pardon. Um, prosecutors allege his own quote words and actions at the Capitol supports that the intent of the Capitol rioters was to capture and assassinate elected officials in the United States government, end quote, according to the Hill. We know uh, the lead uh, prosecutor has backed away from that uh, definitive statement at this point. But, it, you know, we've listened to them chanting, uh, hang Mike Pence also. Uh, Chansley also reportedly left a note for Vice President Mike Pence in the Senate chamber that read, it's only a matter of time, justice is coming. So, so read this. So they talk about the Proud Boys uh, threatening the life of um, Reverend. Uh, so the news follows the striking details that a member of the Proud Boys was arrested and denied uh, after police discovered posts on parlor threatening the life of Reverend Raphael Warnock, uh, the new uh, senator there in Georgia. OK, uh, let's see. Uh, let's squeeze in this clip here. This is from uh, this is only a couple of minutes here. This is from. Uh, 11 alive, uh, dot com in Georgia runoffs arose to limit power of black voters in Georgia, much of South. Okay. Let's go to this clip. That has shifted to the center of the political universe with two Senate races. The process of runoff elections may seem fairly simple, but these contests once served a racially motivated purpose. 11 Alive, Joe Hankey with more for us tonight. Well, many Georgia voters may be familiar with runoff elections. They may not be familiar with the history of runoffs in Georgia and across the South. At the Georgia State Capitol in the 1960s, a state representative named Denmark Groover led a charge for runoff elections. A federal report looking at civil rights in America calls Groover a staunch segregationist. He pushed for runoffs in Georgia as a way to challenge growing black political power and, quote, Support for the majority vote plan reinforced the moderate segregationist position. It did not remove anyone's right to cast a ballot, but it was commonly regarded as hampering African Americans to stigmatize black voters. While still allowing black voters to cast a ballot, runoffs at the time made sure candidates representing the white majority, not the interests of black citizens, would be elected. They don't function precisely that way anymore, uh, but one has to wonder what, what function they do at. Cal Gilson is a political science professor at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. He says runoffs are linked to elections in the South, requiring a candidate to have more than 50 percent or a majority of votes cast to win an election. Runoff uh, is an opportunity uh, for the white majority to come together uh, and uh, beat back the challenge for a black candidate. Frequently, as you know. And when lawmakers such as Groover wrote and passed laws requiring runoffs, they did not hide their intentions. Before anyone was politically correct, people spoke very directly about their sense of race and the importance of maintaining white supremacy. And that's what these electoral rules were intended to do. Currently, Georgia is only one of 10 states, primarily in the South, using runoffs in primaries. Only Georgia and Louisiana use them for general elections. Jilson views runoffs as outdated election law. There's less and less reason and really fewer and fewer states as time time goes by that use runoffs. All right. All right. So that's from uh, 11 Alive um, in uh, Georgia. Check out the article, Runoffs Arose to Limit Power of Black Voters in Georgia, Much of South Experts Say. That's from November 9th, 2020 uh, at 11alive.com. All right. Hey, um, we have the lecture that I did uh, the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the revolutionary, will not be televised on the television. We just posted the link here. It's about a two-hour presentation. We have it on digital download and uh, DVD. And it's available at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. Also, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN Show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN Show through Cash App. And also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show as well. OK. And, or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. That helps us keep broadcasting six nights a week, keep doing the research, stay on the air, pay some of the bills, et cetera. We have to get out of here. We'll be back Monday. We're here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, stay tuned for Pastor Mo. Remember, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We'll kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Peace. All right. Stand by, everybody.
Okay. All right. Uh, also, if you all want to, if you are an African American business owner and you want to advertise with the African History Network, email us at customer service at African History Network dot com. Customer service at African History Network dot com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Um, also, okay. All right. So I got a lot more information on Dr. King. I didn't even get to uh, the article de dealing with myths about Dr. King, but we already we dealt with some of the myths just in the information that I shared with you. So we'll, we'll deal with this throughout the week because I have a ton of information. Okay, we'll deal with this throughout the week. All right, we got to get out of here. Okay, right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Happy birthday, uh, Muhammad Ali. Also, uh, born January seventeenth, nineteen forty-two, and uh, happy birthday as well to. Uh, uh, Dr. King, uh, January 15th, 1929. Then also some other uh, people are celebrating birthdays. We have to deal with uh, a lot of the birthdays on uh, on our show Monday. We just ran out of time. That's so much information here. We just ran out of time. But um, some other people, um, uh, some other people celebrating birthdays, some other celebrities, Steve Harvey. Uh, Steve Harvey, uh, born January 17th, 1957. He turned 64 years old. Um, also, Maxine Jones. Maxine Jones of the legendary group En Vogue. Um, she was born January 16th, 1962. She turned 59 today. Love En Vogue. We know that January 16th, Saturday, January 16th, was the birth date of one shot day. Oh, I remember when Sade came out, uh, when she first came out. So Sade, um, of Nigerian ancestry, uh, she turned 62 years old uh, as well. And um, also Aaliyah. You see Aaliyah behind me over here to my left. Um, Aaliyah, uh, born January 16th, 1979. Uh, um also, we know she passed away tragically in a plane crash, August 25th, 2001. Born Aaliyah Dana Halton uh, on January 16th, 1979. Okay, born in Brooklyn, New York, and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Okay, we got to get out of here. Talk to y'all too. Oh, oh, also, yeah, Michelle Obama. That's right. Michelle Obama's birthday is today as well. Michelle Obama, forever our first lady. She turns uh, 57. So we'll... Um, uh, have birthday acknowledgments uh, also on uh, Monday because uh, I posted something on my Facebook page about Michelle Obama's birthday. Okay, as well. All right, we got to get out of here. Right now, let's correct for own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Talk to, you all, talk to you all tomorrow night. Peace. Visit 4glossygirls.com, that's the number 4glossygirls.com, and follow them on Instagram at 4glossygirls. Do you have an idea or business that requires app development or thinking of moving your IT resources to the cloud? We have post-paid and profit-sharing plans for unique ideas or profitable businesses. Who can take advantage of this unique program? Entrepreneurs with unique ideas, startups, small to medium businesses. Contact us, 267-209-0352. Visit nomadicsystems.net, nomadicsystems.net today. With blackbusinesstea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business, know your numbers, and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business, encourage, patronize, and uplift one another. BlackBusinessTea.com currently has products sold in Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles with proceeds returned to the black community. 
They have a wide selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, hats, sweatshirts that support black owned businesses. Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mo Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at college, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop, and race relations. Dr. Khalid is named among the changers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate Pain and listed as one of the 100 Men of Distinction for Black Enterprise. Recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History 101 Mo Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197. Or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com. 